Okay, so what I'd like to do is just to look at the Heaviside function uh, just a little bit more. So the Heaviside function, if you remember, uh, we just, just define this as, this as this function which just jumps up. So it, it's zero if x is less than uh, zero, and it's one if x is greater than zero. So this is how we defined uh, the, the Heaviside function. So if we try to uh, plot what this looks like, uh, well, uh, for values which are greater than zero, uh, it's going to be one. And for values which are less than zero, it's going to be it's going to be zero. So it's something like that, right? So that's a, a graph uh, of, of what this function looks like. Now you might notice that the way that I've done it uh, right here, I haven't actually defined uh, what 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 this is at, at the value x equals zero. So here's my x-axis. Let's just label that. I haven't defined uh, what 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 this is um, at, at x equals zero. So I have some options, right? Uh, well because I haven't defined it, maybe in the graph, what I can do is I can just do two open circles like that, which doesn't really, uh, which means that it's not either of those values. Um, I have some options. So one of them is I, I, can, I can set it equal to one for x greater than or equal to zero. If I'm doing that, I'm essentially coloring this in. So I'm saying that that value is part of that. Or I can, I can assign it to the other side. When x is less than zero, I, I, I can, um, less than or equal to zero. I can make it zero, which means that I'm coloring that. At that point, um, a third quite natural way of, of thinking about this is that to assign it the value one half, which is the average of the left and the right hand limits uh, at, at that point. But this turns out to be not, not too important uh, whether you do that or not. So at this point, let's just ignore it, right? So that's just some sort of convention that you use at this point, the way that I've defined this, it's not completely clear uh, what the value at x equals zero is. Now, this is also sometimes called uh, the unit step function. So the unit step function. And for obvious reasons, because, well, it's like a unit step, you come like this and you take a step up and you go in that direction. Okay. Uh, now let me just sort of shift this. So I want to sort of define the unit step function, which is shifted. So rather than, at, uh, rather than h of x, I want to look at h of x minus x zero, where x zero is just some value along the, along the axis. Now, if I look at my definition over here, my definition tells me that I'm going to get one as long as this argument, whatever I'm putting in here into, into, into the function h, as long as that is positive, I have to get one. Let's look at this over here. So that tells me that whenever the x minus x zero is positive, I have to get one. Uh, so in other words, I have to get one, one if um, x is greater than x zero. Yeah, because x minus x zero has to be greater than zero. That's, that's what that is. And then I have zero in, in, in the opposite scenario. Um, and, and, and what that means, of course, is, um, well, I'm going to get zero, oops, sorry. I'm going to get zero all the way up to this point. And from that point onwards, I'm going to get one. Yeah, so so that's what that means. Uh, and, and again, it's not completely clear what the value is at x zero. Right? So I can, I, I have these, these various ways of, of thinking of it. Now what I want to do, so, so this is an extension. This is just a generalization of, of, of the previous situation. Because if I put in x zero equals zero, then I get the, the, the previous situation. I get exactly this. So it's a shift of the, of the heavy side function of the unit step function. Okay, what I'm interested in is the derivative of this function. Now, how do I define the derivative? And what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to think about this graphically. So in this diagram down here, I'm going to plot what the graph of the derivative of the function is. So let me write that down here. So this is, uh, this is the function h prime of x, whereas what I have up here is the function h of x. I want to plot the graph of h prime of x. Okay, um, so how do I do this? Well, the derivative is, is a slope of the tangent line at each point. So if I draw the tangent line to the graph at a point over here, well, the tangent line is horizontal, its slope is zero. Tangent line, zero, slope zero, slope zero. On this side as well, slope is zero, slope is zero, slope is zero. So essentially almost everywhere, the slope is zero. So the graph of this function, well, it's going to be zero on that side. And on this side, it's going to be zero as well. Okay, so it's essentially the zero function. But what is it at x equals zero? If I'm trying to draw the tangent line here, 
Well, if I think of this as the unit step function, well, the tangent line suddenly becomes a vertical line. Okay, and a vertical line has a slope of infinity. Or if you prefer, you can just think of approaching this so you have some sort of curve like this. Um, so you have a slope of zero, and then the slope becomes incredibly steep, and then it slowly, gradually, it, it comes down to zero again. And what that means down here is that you're going to get something which looks like that and comes down like that. So sort of in this discontinuous limit where I have a step, uh, what I actually then have is, is, uh, is something which looks like that, right? It, it just shoots up towards infinity. Okay, so my attempt to draw it is that. That's not a very satisfying function. Okay, but that's, that's my attempt to draw the, the derivative of the, of the unit step function. So if I come down here and do the same thing, where well, it's exactly the same idea, there's nothing, nothing new going on. So I have it being zero out here, and I have it being zero beyond that. And at the point x zero, I have a vertical line. That's not a particularly word, vertical line, but uh, a vertical line like that. Okay, where it shoots up towards uh, infinity. So in general, what I can see is that if I want to write down my, my derivative function, right? So here's h prime of x minus x, x zero. My derivative function, h prime of x minus x zero, well, the function is essentially zero almost everywhere. It's zero if x is not equal to x zero, but it's infinity if x equals x zero, right? That's, that's sort of what this is, right? So here's my, my my understanding, my intuitive understanding of uh, of the derivative of the function. However, this is this is not actually acceptable from a mathematical perspective, and I tell you why in a moment. And because it's not acceptable, I'm just going to think of putting this in quotes. Why is this not acceptable? Well, when you think of a function, we have a domain. We put something in from the domain, and it spits out some value which is in the range. And the range, now we are thinking here of functions whose domain is R or some subset of that. And the range is also going to be in R. Uh, but this value is not in R. Infinity is not in R. So this is a bit of a problem. So this thing, this, this supposed function is actually not a function at all. Uh, so I, I, I'm writing this, this down, what I've written down uh, in, in this instance is not actually legitimate. It's not, not a function. However, there's a pretty nice way in characterizing this, and that's using something called a theory of distributions. So let's see how that goes. I want to, I want to be more formal and more rigorous about, about trying to understand the direct delta, the, sorry, I'm sorry, the, the, the derivative of this, of this heaviside function. So in order to do that, I, I, I need to have a class of test functions. So I'm gonna call these test functions. So my test functions are just a bunch of functions, just any old functions which satisfy a bunch, uh, satisfy some conditions. So phi of x is going to be my, my, my a, a general test function. And the conditions that the test functions have to satisfy are, well, in the first case, it has to be infinitely differentiable. Right? So, so this is telling me, um, oops, so this is telling me that, um, so if I said C1, it means the first derivative is continuous. If I mean C2, the second derivative, this is telling me that second, third, fourth, fifth, uh, you know, whatever derivative that you choose is going to be con continuous. So it's an infinitely, infinitely differentiable function. So that's one of, the, one of the conditions. And the other condition I want is that I want to take the limit as x goes to either plus infinity or minus infinity of this function, uh, and I want it to go, be zero. So these are functions which decay at infinity. So test functions are any, any functions which satisfy these two conditions over here. Now, why am I introducing test functions? Well, it turns out that I'm going to try to understand this derivative function, the derivative of the, of the, of the heaviside function, which doesn't make sense as written over here. I want to understand this not in this sense because that's a problem, but I want to understand it in an integral sense. I want to understand something related to the integral of that function. So how do I write this? So I'm looking at negative infinity to infinity. So here's the function I want to understand, h prime of x minus x zero. But I want to understand what happens when I apply this particular operation. So I multiply this supposed function by a general test function phi of x, and then I just integrate this from negative infinity to infinity. 
what do I get? Well, it turns out that, that this can be made perfectly well defined. So even though it's difficult for me to actually write down what h prime is, what the derivative of the Heaviside function is, I will be able to write down what this integral of it is, any integral of this form. So how will I do that? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to use integration by parts. You might remember that integration by parts is a useful thing to just simply move a derivative over from one, uh, one term to the other. So uh, my, the standard integration by parts formula, if you remember this, uh, the integration by parts formula is that if you uh, u dv equals uv minus v du, so you just sort of uh, move the, the, the integral sign, uh, that's your integration by parts formula in general, but if it's a definite integral, so if it's an integral from a to b, I have to make sure that I put the, the limits a to b, but I need to also do that in the boundary term over here, right? So this is, this is my integration by parts formula in general. So if I want to do integration by parts on this, uh, what I want to do, my, my main goal is to move this over here. So what I do is I take my function u uh, to be phi of x, and then I take my function dv, uh, dv to be h prime of x minus x zero dx. So here's, here's is the choice that I make because when I multiply these two together, I get u dv, which is exactly what I have over here. Okay, um, so once I, once I make that choice, I need to figure out what du is and what v is, right? So du is then going to equal phi prime of x dx. Uh, and, and v, well, I need to integrate uh, this thing here. h prime, I integrated, I just get h. So it's h of x minus x zero. Okay, so that's the formula that I need to apply to this. Okay, so let's write this now. So my integral of h prime of x minus x zero, phi of x dx, this integral is going to equal uh, uv. Okay, so let's write that down. So u is phi of x and, and v is h of x minus x zero. Okay, minus, uh, the integral from negative infinity to infinity. And this boundary term also has the, in, I have to look at the limits. Um, and, and then what do I have? So I have VDU is next. So VDU is going to give me H of X minus X zero, um, then phi uh, prime of X DX. Okay, so here's what I need to do now. Can I make sense of this? Let's look at these boundary terms first, right? So phi as x goes to plus infinity goes to zero because that was one of the conditions of my test function. And in this limit as well, it goes to zero. So that's good. And you know, this thing is bounded. So you're not going to get an infinity times zero or anything like that. You're going to get uh, you know, zero times something finite. So both those boundary terms go to zero. Okay, that's fine. Um, so what I'm getting is zero for, for all the boundary terms. Then I got this negative sign here. Um, now I can do something just a little bit clever. Now I know that the, 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 the Heaviside function, this is one if x is greater than x zero, but it's zero for values of x less than x zero. So what, even though I'm doing this integral from negative infinity to infinity, all values less than x zero are zero. And for values greater than x zero, the contribution from this is just a one. So what I have here is in fact an integral from x zero to infinity of phi prime of x dx. Okay, that's all that's, that's remaining. I don't have to write the h because it's either zero in which case I've thrown it out or it's one. Okay, now can I do this integral? Well, this is pretty nice because this is the derivative of a function which you then integrate. So that's easy. So I got this minus sign in front. So this is just phi of x. And then I had to put in the values x zero and infinity. What happens when I put in these values? Well, minus, uh, when I put in infinity, I get zero because the function phi has to decay. And then I get minus phi x zero. So I get phi of x zero. Okay. 
So after doing this integral and using integration by parts, this is what I got. It's probably worth writing this down again. So what I have is negative infinity to infinity, h prime of x minus x zero. Then I have a test function and I have dx. Uh, when I do this, what I just got was phi of x zero. That's it. Right, just let's go back and look at it. Yep, phi of x zero. Okay. All right, this is pretty neat. Um, so even though I don't quite understand this as a function, I understand how it operates on general test functions. So what it does is that it just takes, I'm doing this integral over all values of x, I'm integrating over all values of x, it just picks out the value of x, which corresponds to this x zero. Now, if you remember the intuition, this thing sort of had a spike at x0. It goes up towards infinity, right, at, at, at x0 and it's zero everywhere else. So you've got this very, very strong spike at this point. It picks up the value of, of phi at that spike and it just spits it out, okay? That's the operation of this. So what we're going to do is we're going to define something. I'm going to define something called the Dirac delta now I'm tempted to call this a function, but I can't. I'm going to call it the Dirac delta distribution. This is sometimes, this word distribution is sometimes, uh, you know, rephrased as a generalized function. All right, so what is, what is the generalized function? Well, it's this guy here, okay? And I'm going to use the symbol delta Right, so the symbol delta is what, what I'm going to use for the direct delta uh, distribution. So, so what, what, what is my defining characteristic? My defining characteristic is that I take this and I take delta of x minus x zero. Okay, so this and this are supposed to be the same. So my delta distribution, this generalized function is just the derivative of the unit step function. Uh, and, and then I have phi of x dx, this gives me a phi of x zero, okay? So here is, is, is my, main, uh, my main result here, right? So if I have, uh, if I have a, a general test function, it really doesn't matter what it is, as long as it's a nice smooth function which decays at infinity. Um, if I do this particular integral, it just picks out the value at x zero. Okay, that's exactly what it does. Let's go back and take a look at this again, right? Let's look at our intuition here. So here is my 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 function, right? So this this thing here is this 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 is what I, what my delta function is. It's the derivative of of the um, of the unit step function, and and as, as you can see, it's zero everywhere, and then it just jumps up. It's very very sharp and then it goes, uh, it's zero elsewhere. So if I multiply this by any old function, right? So I've got some function, I multiply it. Well, I'm just going to essentially get zero because I've got zero everywhere else and I'm just going to get zero. But the point is that over here, I've got a very, very sharp spike. So whatever the value that that function took at that point, it gets uh, accentuated in certain ways. And that's what's going on here. Yeah, so whatever my function phi of x is, it just picks out the value at the point x zero and it gives me this, okay? Now this is a, a more or less ex, uh, analogous to the, the, so what we had for the chronica delta. So the chronica delta is in which we had something like this, n equals minus infinity to infinity. If I had a, anything like that, cn, um, and then I have delta mn, well, it just picks out it just picks out that particular value m, yeah? So this is, this is uh, what, what happens over here is that you know, n takes on all of these values and, and you keep on taking these values over here, but the chronica delta just picks out the value uh, of n and that gives me cn. Well, this is, the, this, this is uh, what I've got over here uh, with, the, with, the, with the chronic, with, with the direct delta is the, is the continuous analog of it. So the continuous analog of the, of the, of the summation is, is, a, is an integral um, and uh, it just picks out that value, right? So that's, 
that's pretty neat. That's the defining characteristic of the Dirac delta distribution or the Dirac delta generalized function. It just picks out the value. Um, okay, so once we have this in place, we can use this as our as our definition, if you like. So it's defined in terms of this this integral, right? So you we can do something rather nice here. Um, so I might ask you the question: uh, What is the derivative? What is the derivative of this of, of, of the of the Dirac delta? Well, the Dirac delta is a, is a generalized function anyway, so you can't really think of the derivative in in any reasonable way, and you you know you try to use intuition. Um, and and you come back to come back to this picture here. Well, here's my picture supposedly of the, of the of the function. Well, the derivative of the function is going to be zero, and then it's going to be some sort of infinity, and it's going to be zero. So once again, you'll think it's this, but that intuition actually is not good enough. Right? So in order to understand this, we actually have to go back uh, to to this same idea, uh, and and this is actually quite simple. Because I want to understand this this generalized function, this de this uh, this distribution, um, and how do I do that? Well, I do it in terms of uh, of, of integrals like this. Right. So I have a test function. I look at what happens over uh, when I operate on this test function in this particular way. If I use integration by parts, which I'm not going which I'm not going to do in detail over here, all that happens is that I'm able to move this derivative over there. And, and the boundary terms all go away because, because my, my, my function here decays to zero uh, at, at the end points. So the boundary terms go away. Uh, so what I, what I end up getting is that when I'm doing integration by paths, remember I get this negative sign. So the negative sign that I get using integration by paths, that negative sign, that negative sign. Right? So I'm going to have a negative sign when I do integration by paths. So what I'm going to get here is negative, the integral from negative infinity to infinity, then all I have to do is just, just transfer the derivative over. Right? So what I have is delta of x minus x zero, phi prime of x dx. Okay, um, so that's by, by using integration by parts. Now, I can do something else. I can go a little bit beyond this. When I look at this expression over here, it tells me that I'm, I have a test function, which now is phi prime of x. I have a test function and I'm multiplying by the, by the Dirac delta and I'm doing this integration. I have to just pick out the value of this at the point x zero. That's all I end up doing. So the, the, what I get here is phi prime of x zero, which is the value of my, my test function relevant to this evaluated at x zero. So that's what it is. So that tells me then, uh, of, of, of what, what's going to happen. At least it tells me, uh, it gives me an understanding of this generalized function, the derivative of the Dirac delta function. What is it? Well, it's an object which operates on test functions in this particular way. If you do that, then you're going to get this, okay? So that's what, uh, what, what, what the derivative of the, of the Dirac delta uh, distribution uh, looks like. Okay, we'll stop here um, for now and talk more about this, uh, of course, in class.